Hey there, Eugene here. So, I was considering recently the life of Peter the Great. So, I read this specific biography of him by Robert Macy. Is that how you pronounce it? Not sure. Uh, when I was in high school, either a junior or a senior, I believe, might have been a sophomore when I got it. Um, so, pretty much, this biography has a very interesting story about Peter the Great being a young kid, which I believe is relatable to all the talk you see right now about training the new workforce in the 21st century. Yada, yada, yada. Um, a lot of stuff they're pushing on, you got to realize a lot of the concepts have already existed before in the 20th century. They actually read books on the Soviet Union and not necessarily about the war and about the, politi the politics. Like, if you, I can't remember what the specific book I was reading, but it, you can dive into the culture of the Soviet Union to understand a lot better. And one of the things I remember reading was, the, was that the intellectuals wanted to create education, make it available to everyone. And this was a basic idea of the Enlightenment that had come the uh, centuries before, the 1700s and 1800s, right? 18th and 19th centuries. And the Soviet Revolution created the first, well, I'm not sure the first time, but I like the first time in Russia, where everyone was educated. And... The basic concept they were trying to do is that they were going to create a new man. And they, you, you, you can Google that new Soviet man. Um, it's an actual thing, kind of like the Nazis had their own uh, Ubermensch, their own new man they want to breed out. Uh, the Soviets had their own version of the new man. I mean, we, they, were, they were quite different, but basically the totalitarian social engineers were trying to <laughs> eradicate current humanity and quote unquote improve it into something that they um, consider superior. And for the Soviets, they would one of the quotes I remember was really stark um, struck with me is that they wanted to make the average man an equal to Aristotle. And they were going to do this through education. And if you read or watch the current people talking about how they're going to revolutionize the 21st century with all these learning techniques and going to apply all this cool stuff into the digital world, it's very reminiscent to what I've read before about the Soviet Union. Right? And the Soviet Union had some has some, some, some very effective stuff, but at the same time, you kind of over-focus on engineering skills. And then from the engineering skills, because first what you had, you had, you had the revolution, right? And then you have the people that were left over that were not killed off by the Soviet revolution. And they were pretty much told, hey, um, you want to continue to live, you're going to be working with us, but under the new regime. Right, and these old regimes, they try to replace them as soon as possible. Once you got a younger generation raised and educated on the Soviet principles and get in the technical details of life, they grow older, they try to kick out the old regime as soon as possible. So all the old social ideas would disappear and the new people, the younger generation was pretty much brainwashed for supporting the Soviet Union, had the know how and was able to apply. But the problem was that they over focused on um, engineering. And a lot of these engineering principles were tried to apply into the social realm. It was a complete disaster. Um, and But you're getting some similar concepts to today. Like, well, they talk about aimlessly about, um, it's kind of going to the other extreme, right? So with, with Soviet, you have centralized control and, and, and engineering processes. And the what you, what you see going on right now is that you have a, some that might have read the basics of, uh, say, uh, complex com, com, complexity complex here right about, about how complex systems work and what have you and you hear them talk and you realize they probably read some very superficial articles about it or probably sat down in some lecture someone mentioned it they really have not that dug in to what it is 
But what they're doing now is that they're throwing out these big words, pretending that they understand the topic, which is you, you do understand and you realize they're just blowing hot air. And they're saying stuff, for example, that the new workforce, workforce is going to be decentralized and the employees are going to be creative. And they're going to be they're making their own decisions and applying these decisions to the workforce in real time. So this new corporate environment could be highly more effective than the previous centralized model because the workers are going to be reacting in real time. And if you really sit down and think about what they're hell, what what they're talking about, you realize that they're just blowing hot air the same way. Um, you cannot have every single goddamn employee being able to make their own decisions and go in the right and whatever, whatever the direction they want to do. There has to be constraints, even if, even if they have certain authority to act within themselves. And you're going to realize that most employees and even managers do not understand the business model. Right? Maybe say, for example, they might understand marketing, but they do not understand accounting. They probably do not understand the IT system being processed. For example, what, what's the CRM doing that they have? What are the processes? How can we get the, get information stored and use that in marketing? So that would be someone else trying to make the connections. They probably don't understand, understand what, what sales are doing, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Right, supply chain, like the, 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 the logistics guy. So you you can't have these people making their own decision. Like you have to have someone on top that has a general understanding of what's going on. Like right? they might not be an expert and they will not be and all the different parts, but they understand what these different parts do and how they're interconnected and if you affect one part how that might affect the other side of it right so even say for example the marketing team right they might have a great idea on marketing x product and a new region but maybe we just don't have the the actual budget for it maybe the logistics department has no way to get the product out at X amount or what have you into the region the marketing department wants to talk about. So it gets really convoluted, right? But the basic gist you hear right now is these complexity, decentralized, uh, bottom up. And a lot of this modern nonsense, like you, you, if, if it's not clear to you, I'm telling you right now, it's nonsense. You don't believe me. You, you, like, if you don't believe me by now, a lot of stupid crap that are pushing, we could have had that push already. And say, for example, the communists, for example, you, you still, or, quote, or a lot of these, 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 these like, or the communists, we have had companies like quote, collaboratives or stock owned companies where we could have companies where the employees own the company, right? And you see Karl Marx, the whole concept of Karl Marx is that the evils of the proletariat was that they were working for a company and that company was reaping the benefits and giving it to their people who own the company, the capitalists, who put the money and know-how into the company. And the employee were getting a salary. They were not getting a cut of the percentage of that company. And again, there's no explanation of what's going to happen if the company goes bankrupt, right? Is the, is the employee going to pay for it or he's going to walk away, go, go to a different company? And the actual people who put the finance and risk into the company, um, do they get to share the downside if the company didn't work, right? They, they, they didn't never address this. But the, the point is, if the communists, which are socialists, which are actually rising off right now, really believe that this ownership of everyone in the, in the company worked they could implement it right now they can make uh, employees stock own companies and run them and show the world what a better system there is this is but they never do it right because it doesn't fucking work that's the basic gist of it um there can be some few examples to make it work but it's in a row if it worked they would have implemented these dumbasses can't even run a goddamn Burger King, but they want to run the whole economy. Um, so that's a 
big sidetrack with the topic I was going to do. Um, but Peter the Great, Peter the Great, and going back to this, um, a lot of the people pushing about the new st- uh, new ideas for education are not entirely wrong. Um, a lot of the, the educational system that um, was created was actually to create factory workers. If my memory serves correctly, it started in Germany during the Industrial Revolution. I can't remember under who, if it was Bismarck, or who implemented exactly this. Um, if you read the book, The Iron Kingdom, they go over this. I um, can't remember exactly what the hell. The time now, now I'm curious, I want to go back and really read that. But basically, what it was is that before the Industrial Revolution, you had employers, but a lot of these employers, for example, were um, people that the men knew. Women generally didn't work um, uh, or did like some basic housework, but the men would find it to be um, insulting if they were to submit to the authority of a man they didn't know. A man, a lot of times, they would consider to be less manly than they were. They could beat them up, beat up the gun of fist fight, for example. Um, that That's still the case. And a lot of hyper, I was going to hyper masculine, but like in a lot of environments, if, if you see a man and you know you can kick his ass, um, you it's really hard for you to respect the guy unless he has some level of I, I don't want to necessarily say intelligence because if you you can have, have intelligence men that are geeks but they're, they're not respected but they they have to be some kind of authority behind that right so say hey, for example you, you might get an entrepreneur who's a short guy um you could probably beat him up but you talk to him there's this power behind it this force um then okay yeah this guy's all in charge <laughs> and people around him under understand this but the generally they would not submit to people that were not part of his family i guess they found this to be uh, to be degrading so the educational system took the children away from the immediate family so they started with public education right so previously the education was uh, done privately if at all, maybe even the household, so homeschool. But well, they took all the kids and they took them to a new environment and they made the teachers to be the form of authority they had to submit to. So now you get strangers to the form of from authority. And they would teach them skill sets that would make them good factory workers. So it, it was a two way combination, which they explicitly uh, came up with. You would train them with the explicit technical skills you want and you're going to make them submit to a different form of authority. So they're kind of right in saying that uh, partly that these education system is outdated, but I will say it's outdated for some people. If you look at the jobs from a lot of people, um, it's very similar to um, factory work. I mean, it might be like a lot of data entry or customer service, or they have some basic technical skill and, you know, it's, it, they, uh, most people's jobs don't require a high level of creativity. And one of the problems, too, about this whole concept, that this modern concept that AI is going to be created, you have to realize that creativity requires a certain IQ base for someone to be considered creative. So if memory serves, it was about 120 points at least for someone to be considered creative. And the way they judge this is based on the number of new original ideas that a certain individual was able to create. So if you had less than 120 points IQ, uh, you were not creative. Uh, creativity started at about 120 and went up the higher the IQ spectrum went. So... If the average IQ is 100, right, and the minimum requirement is 120, there's there's studies about that. You can probably just Google the data I'm giving you. You gotta realize most of the population is not gonna be creative, right? And if you look at career choice, so people go to school 
and they pick what career they want um, versus IQ, there is a correlation. So people with low IQ typically pay careers that uh, are not very cognitively demanding, cognitively demanding, and people with high IQ do, right? You got computer scientists, the engineers, right? Financiers, etc. Versus like elementary school teachers. Um, so they make these decisions by themselves for the most part. Um, I do believe recently you have a lot of push uh, where you, you get people who get the school paid for and the standards of um, a school have dropped and you get a lot of people jumping into careers that they were not supposed to be there um, because they're, they're bloody idiots. They can't even, like you see them in LinkedIn or what have you, commenting on an article and you realize these guys and gals don't have basic reading comprehension at all but they got a degree and now they're quote unquote professional when they shouldn't be a professional so anyways so the people talking about the new education and the new workforce are correct in the sense that it's outdated for but I'll, I'll say it's, it's, it's not out there for everyone because most people will remain on a job that requires then grasping some technical skills and do repetitive stuff and does not require a lot of cognitive demanding skill sets. And this is not a matter of education. It's a matter of IQ points. There's only so much certain people can handle. And a lot of this is, is natural. And you can do stuff to improve it. Um, we could, sh we should definitely focus on increasing diet. And there might be ways to modify the case. What am I talking about right here? That it might make people slightly intelligent. But most of the part, if, if I run correctly, it was something like it's not a 50 50 between nature and nurture. It was more like 70 or 80 was nature. And about 30, 20% was nurture. So that's, as far as I remember, that's currently the closest estimate they have between the debate between nature and nurture. It's both, but a lot more nature than nurture. So that being said, there could be the possibility of separating people based on their potential, right? And one of the problems was. I, I grew up in Mexico, right? so a, a lot of the stuff that people grew up, like the U.S. grew up with, and their views don't, don't, don't make any sense for me. So, say for example, they're, they spend more money in average on people with special needs than gifted children, right? So, this is not to say to abandon people with special needs, but if you look at where the money is going, if you've got someone's gifted, they usually are put in the classroom with average people, intelligent people. And I do believe I was one of them myself. It's goddamn boring. Like, I was one of the guys that I was sitting down in the classroom and I could not wait for the classroom to end so I can go back to my room and read something else, like watch um, some documentaries or speeches like I, just, I find doc documentaries quite boring most of the time but actually if you get like the next person doing speech because that's quite interesting and uh, they spin like that they ignore the gifted because i guess it's a whole notion of equality i believe that they they want the performance of everyone to be relatively equal so i believe this, this what's happening here is that they see someone who's gifted Okay, well, he has to get enough. We have to help the ones falling behind to catch up to the average. And that should be our goal. And that, that's what the finance going on. But if you think about society as general, that is a tremendous mistake. What you should be doing instead is focusing on who are the ones that are showing that they're gifted. And you and you can't always know, right? There, there can be examples of someone who believe, believes a dumbass turns out when he wants to 
grows up is quite smart, and vice versa. Um, and being told that you're actually smart from a young age might be uh, might have negative effects on the child. And you can read Carol Dweck, for example, for that. But generally, you should be able to determine if what the IQ of a person is. There has been studies showing that the IQ of a child as a child does correlate with intelligence as an adult. So if you can catch someone young who seems to be gifted, they are likely to remain that way as an adult. And these specific people should be the ones that get most of finance because these are the people that pretty much going to drive civilization forward. These are the uh, geniuses, right? It's the idea of, uh, the, there, there's this one historical concept called the great man theory, right? You could probably apply it to a woman too. Um, but basically for history, right? So this, this, this is his history, right? So for women, you could probably apply it from now on onward. But most of history has been ruled by men, right? There's some few exceptions here and there, but basically men have been the rulers of society and the patriarchy and all this and that. But in the basic, I can't remember the guy who wrote this book. So he pretty much has, um, he goes over some archetypes. For example, Wotan or Odin would be one of the archetypes, or Muhammad would be another one. Um, he he goes over the archetypes and the basic idea between the great man of history, Khan theory is that history is pushed forward by great men of genius right it's not necessarily that there's these unforeseen movements that are happening here and there for example uh, napoleon was a man who saved the revolution per se um but um without this great man there's, there's, there's no full moving forward, right? So X person creates this great invention, this new technology is applied generally to the rest of the population. This starts doing this, a spark effect. So there might be a slight exaggeration for it. So when, it, when I read it, um, there, there are other forces behind it, behind it, right? So it's not entirely based on specific key men. Um, changing things, but there's a lot of truth to it too. Um, if you you have to realize that there, there's certain individuals who step up and are capable of great things. So, and if you actually read their biographies, there's certain factors behind them that um, I believe helped achieve this. So, was Peter Gray going back to this? Peter Great and uh, to a certain extent Napoleon had some very similar backgrounds, um, and actually Napoleon would talk about Peter the Great and some, and say that he identified with Peter the Great more than any other leader. Well, maybe that's an exaggeration. Well, he identified with Peter the Great uh, because Peter the Great understood the importance of artillery, for example, and Peter the Great, um, if you don't realize this. When he was an adult, he would go to Europe and dress up as a common man. And he would walk the streets. And there was actually a, a case where they even threw rocks at him, some children. And he had to chase the king of Russia away. And these, these children are throwing rocks at the king of Russia. And they have no idea it's the king of Russia. And he, Peter Gray has run away from front of the kids. So Napoleon would say that Peter, Peter Gray, um, he was born a king. But he lowered himself to the common man, to understand the common man, then rose again and became a better king. And Napoleon came from common, well, he, he, he was noble, but he had a very poor background, right? So when he says he kind of came from a noble, uh, from, sorry, from, from a poor common background. And being poor and living in the street, like, not in the streets, but like being engaged with a common man, Gave him an understanding of how the world works and how to talk to his soldiers that the people who grew up inside the aristocrats, see, didn't understand. 
um, which is what's probably one of the reasons why Bono was so good at uh, creating loyalty. Um, if you look at the uh, what what he did in Egypt and you know, after um, he he was expelled, he came back and the people he sided with him after they had dethroned him. Um, he knew how to talk to people, and not Napoleon didn't identify great those guys. So he's a great um, in both Napoleon didn't have the top notch education, right? So going back to what I said, maybe you're training people a little better, but um, you got to really didn't have a top notch education. So what this means is that they had a lot of lever liberty to play with them on on themselves because um, the top notch universities or schools for for showing the time um well for Peter Gray's case was someone going to the palace and uh, teaching the children like the uh, the sons of the aristocrats there and Napoleon case it wasn't academy it was like a poly pay school but Napoleon didn't go to the best school and Peter the Great well, he was not considered the heir of Russia so he was given an education but he was left uh, by himself for a long time and they just didn't pay that much attention to him. so the best minds that were in Russia a lot of them were foreigners going their education the children did not get to sit down and teach Peter so what did Peter the Great do instead? Um, he actually spent a lot of his time playing at war. And he would get canyons, and these canyons would be filled up with uh, bags of flour. And he would create mock wars. And he would have his friend the other side, he in one side, and they would actually go to buy a battle. And if you have the flower hit you, you're dead. And this was a very big part of him. So he pretty much just created these for fun. Like he wanted to play war and he was uh, you know, son of the, king, the emperor of the king at the time. So they just went ahead and freaking play war. Like just do whatever the son of the king wants to do. Um, so the key concept here is that they had a lot of time by themselves unsupervised and this i believe is a key factor right if you if you're going to going to do an education do not overdo it do not like plan for every single goddamn minute um like some, some, some american parents do it um these have no free time for children i mean no the children have no free time and The artifact is like from a very young age, he's learning leadership skills, so he's being in charge. Um, you should probably, if you find kids who are gifted and they work in projects, you have to put them in charge. Like these are the kids that are going to have the high IQ, are the ones with the greatest potential. You should be doing like uh, projects. I mean, I, I'm, not, I'm not saying isolate them completely from everyone else. <sighs> Let me get this. But that would be kind of hard, right? So, you, you you have to put them in on, on leadership skills somehow. Um, it could be sports or games, I'm not sure. But that has been a correlation I've read again and again and again that the the children who were meant to be leaders were put on leadership decisions, and they had other people in their own age groups that um, they were in charge of telling them what, what to do in certain like, events, say, for example, or organizing either warfare or what have you, um, putting the future leaders in charge. And you have to do this. I feel like right now there's this whole concept of everyone's equal, but yada, yada, yada. You, this, this, human speech is not necessarily based on that. Human speech is based on a hierarchy. And they, they, they haven't studied like your brain, everyone's brain picks up status and hierarchy 
almost instantaneously. And this is something in the anime kingdom. Like, there's there's no freaking equality um, in the higher animals. Like, you, even insects fight for dominance. But I mean, even like, in insects, you might say, like, one ant to so a second is not second ant is not that big a deal. But once you get to fishes like vertebrates, they are fighting for dominance. They're fighting for their space, and going from fish to human that's a long way in the evolutionary chain. So if hierarchy exists between fishes and humans, um, how can these dumbasses go and say like? We should all be equal and the equality should be. There's, 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 there's much of fucking socialist ideas that being push. And these guys are too. I, I'm not sure they're just too stupid to believe it, or it's one of those things that they wish it to happen and they believe maybe nurture can push it to happen or have a close idea of it. Um, another thing I have for I believe too is that a lot of the people pushing the equality stuff, they don't necessarily believe in equality, but they go back to Nietzsche's ideas of slave and master morality. Um, they have something against the people or the type of people that uh, naturally have a higher status. And you can see that like in a lot of teachers, they'll get angry at uh, certain students, I believe, that are... Uh, how to say it? Extroverted or proactive, like they they cherry pick what victim group they identify with, and they push that group up while bringing everyone else that they believe are the oppressors down. And this has been my story, especially in California. Um, But enough of that. It's pretty late. It's like one thirty right now. We gotta get up in six. <laughs> but basically, sort of wrap up my head here. Right now. So basically, what what you have to do? You have you, you have to separate. You have you have to get well, who are the people that hide the key with the kids? Who are gonna be the hot performers? Give them some free time. But B, give them the ability to also create your own crab like, and this might be a lot easier say for example to do this in something virtually but you have to give them the ability to to be creative and from this playtime i believe uh peter the great was able to be such a great commander as an adult because from the playtime he got as a kid he directly developed the skill sets that he used in the real world as an adult and I don't believe they mentioned in the book, but he and he admitted to it. Another thing is he he did, for example, he uh, he really wanted to have a fleet. Uh, Russia didn't have a fleet at the time, uh, military merchant boats, boats, and he went there and he would work like a common man making the boats from scratch. He was working the wood and chipping away and uh, making these boats. Um, so that's another fascinating thing. So pretty much just have the even if they're the top performers too, I guess, you have to have them do... <coughs> do, do some of the dirty work. <coughs> One thing's Matthew did pretty good is that they had, um... So they kind of had, like, these technical um, courses where you're like, an electrician or carpenter or stuff like that. I think that, that would be pretty useful. But <clears throat> you definitely have to have opportunities for these people to be creative but and express leadership skills. But this notion that this can be applied to every single person and every single person has a cap capability of being a leader and so on, that's a mistake. Um, you have to be, you, you have to realize what talent is and focus on that. Um, but yeah, definitely what you have to realize too is that, yeah, there are these tacit skills and creativity and, uh, leadership that can be and should be developed. 
but it's not everyone, man. You're not going to have every single person be a leader. You have these decentralized organizations where everyone is equal and everyone is equally capable of making decisions and everyone's making decisions and going their own way in the corporation. You got because you got to focus. Yes, like it was in the 19th century with the Germans, the education model is specifically tailored to how is a workforce on uh, currently or in the near future going to be, right? Um, and what they're pushing right now is just a bunch of nonsense. It's, it's, it's a goddamn fantasy. I look what the Germans did in the nineteenth century. They got it right. They realized with the Industrial Revolution, this is how the world works, the business world works for the most part, right? That education system didn't go to everyone, uh, but the group of people that were going to work in the factories, that's what they taught them. Um, and the group of people that were, for example, going to be for leadership positions, uh, specifically in the military, I can't remember how you pronounce the goddamn name, but there was a, a military school that was pretty revolutionary. Um, and taught a lot of leadership skills. skills. Uh, the, the students were written the Iliad and, you know, what the, the Franco-Prussian War, if you can see how effective they were, even during the Napoleon War, they did some changes, but uh, pretty much what happened is that they got the ass kicked by Napoleon and they reimagined what the hell they should do to go back and become a superpower because the techniques developed by Frederick the Great worked during Frederick the Great but were no longer working during Napoleon. Napoleon just devastated them. Um, so you have to, yeah, you have to have to create the idea because realize you are going to need very creative people. You are going to need very creative people in your future. But you have to promote the best and the best. It has to be an elite uh, based on meritocracy. Right? Um, you're not going to have a complex functioning society by simply sh trying to make everyone average and focusing on the low hanging fruits. And this is what I've seen China is doing. Uh, say compared to the West, um, they have these very, very strict requirements to uh, get in the top schools, and the kids just fight for it by based on their performance. And you can argue that there's other ways maybe to decide. And they, there have been studies. Say for example, there are people who work to perform better under pressure. And other people who perform better without pressure, right? So you might have people who perform very well and are very capable, but do not perform well in a high pressure job, uh, which these Chinese tests might be excluding. But I mean, I see them, they are working to get the best of that's capable in their country. And once they get in top universities, those or schools, not universities, uh, those are the ones that are getting highly financed and they're focusing on the top people and they're doing a pretty damn good job. So these, <laughs> this model, I believe the Chinese, I mean, there's, there's a lot of stuff I don't necessarily agree with what, what they're doing. I believe they focus too much on explicit knowledge, which is not what I'm talking about here. Better the grade, being creative. Actually, they, they, they have a problem in creativity, but they do focus on the top guys and they're trying to fix the problem. Um, in contrast, U.S. trying to make everyone equal and oh, God damn, dude, this freaking school in the U.S. is so goddamn annoying. I was telling you, I was going out there. I hated it, not because it was they like school in general. It's too fucking easy. And you have to do something about it. But you gotta realize that when you put everyone in the same goddamn classroom and you have a slow pace, you're trying to do it by the lowest common denominator, it's goddamn boring. It's boring. It's boring. And it's boring because it's too damn easy, it's too damn slow. But the other guys believe it's boring because it's too damn hard. 
they don't get it. Those guys need to be in a different room. You gotta focus on the top guys. Um. Anyways, this was supposed to be a five-minute video. Turned out to be forty. Uh, since it always happened to me. Um. Yeah. Have a good night.